be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I've thought about this text for a couple weeks now. This is one of the weirdest stories you've probably ever heard. How many of you have heard this story before this morning? Oh, wow. More hands than last week. Good. It's an interesting story that we find in Kings to talk about Solomon's wisdom. And I've been thinking about this story for weeks. And how does it mesh with Reformation? And how does it come upon these six, which i got to set the chairs up here in a minute to bring those six guys up here so that you can ask them their questions. Who's got a question for them? I've got one. <laughs> You got questions? Okay. So we'll bring them up here in just a minute. But I've been thinking about this, and then yesterday, does everybody know what happened yesterday? I have to get, I have to get, just, I'm just going to probably go away from the text here for a minute. You're just going to have to come along with me on a journey this morning. Because yesterday morning, I was, my daughter and I were at rehearsal for The Sound of Music. Where she's in it, I'm playing for it next weekend at O'Connor. There's a shameless plug. O'Connor Falls High School <laughs> Musical next weekend. If you want to come, but we were at rehearsal, and and one of the one of the other adult players in the pit, we were talking during a little break, and he showed me on his phone, um, eight killed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at the Tree of Life synagogue, because apparently some man came running in and said all Jews must die, and went on a, a rampage, and just started shooting up the synagogue while there was a naming ceremony for a baby. It winds up that 11 people died yesterday because somebody can't understand how somebody else can worship in a way that's different than them. <clears throat> and that's kind of what happened 500 years ago. You see, Luther didn't want to start a new church. He didn't want to start a new denomination. He didn't want to start anything new. He wanted to help people in the church see that they were keeping people from seeing who God could be in their lives. And so he posted some things for discussion. And rather than having an open and honest discussion about it, people got upset and people got worried because things weren't going to happen the way that I wanted them to happen and things weren't going to happen the way that I need for them to happen and things aren't going to work my way because I've got to listen to what somebody else thinks and I've got to let somebody else live their life and understand who they are. See, and then we get this text this morning where Solomon, who is whose son? David and Bathsheba. Remember that, right? Solomon is the son of the marriage that David did to kill people so that he could have someone else's wife. And Solomon is the offspring of that. And Solomon is not actually the one who is supposed to be king. Right? If you read all of the book of Kings, it starts out in chapter 1 with Adonijah, I think is, is, is the oldest son of David's name. And he's the one that should actually be king. But Solomon gets anointed king. And Solomon in this text, he asks, he's, he's in Gibbon, which is not where we should be worshiping. And he's offering sacrifices there. And the Lord comes to him and says... Ask whatever you want, and I will give it to you. So my question, first question in that is, if God came to you and said, whatever you ask me for, I'll give it to you, what would you ask for? And this isn't like just God coming and saying a, a question. This is, this is a command. This is an imperative. The word for ask is an imperative, which means... Tell me now what I'm supposed to give you. And what would you ask for? What would you say? Some say that this is in here because it wasn't actually a dream that Solomon had, but it was to show that it was a test of whether or not Solomon was, was worthy to be king. And Solomon passed the test with flying colors because what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. And the Bible tells us that according to legend that there was no king, there was no one, there was no judge, no anything that was higher than Solomon in understanding and wisdom and being able to discern what God wanted. 
And because he asked for that, God said, not only am I going to give you this wisdom, but I'm also going to bless you with all of these other things. I'm going to give you riches, and I'm going to give you honor, and I'm going to give you a long life. Which he caveated, if you follow in my ways. And then we get this weird story of these two prostitutes. Right? And why are they prostitutes? There's a reason for that. Why are they not named? Did you notice that? The first woman, the second woman, one says this, one says that. They never name them. They never, they never bring them to a level that we should care about them. And why is that? Because Solomon asked for wisdom when God came to him and said, whatever you ask for, I'll give it to you. And Solomon asked for wisdom. And that, and that shows that he's not only looking out for himself, but he's also looking out for everyone. And who is everyone according to the king? Everyone. Everyone. Right? So he needs to look out for everyone. He needs to look out for the lowest of the lows that never has a name. It shows that Solomon is accessible to everybody and he doesn't care who you are. He's going to listen to you. And he's going to understand where you're at and he's going to try to help you through the things that you need to go through. And then we get this really weird story, which we're not going to get into because there's way too many details to talk about. But there's two women, and one of them kills a baby and then steals a baby. And then one of them says she, she killed her baby in the middle of the night, but how does she know that if she's actually sleeping? There's way too many things going on here. But Solomon, in all of his wisdom, right, says, bring me a sword and we're going to cut the kid in half. And this is one of the issues that, that really just... I don't know, irks me or gets to me about this story is, at this point in time, the real mother, right, because who of us who has a kid would not ultimately give up ever seeing that child again if we knew that they could go on living? We would give our last whatever to make sure that our children would go on. So the mother says, don't kill the baby, give it to the other woman. And this is the part that just irks me. The other woman's like, well, no, if I can't have it, nobody should have it, right? It's like, I could care less. She was just a mother, not a day ago. And her thoughts on other people's lives is just like, just go ahead and kill it. Not even giving it up, right? That's actually what it says in the text. Divide it. It's not divide the child, it's divide it. She's already devoided that baby of life. Because it's not about that other people. It's all about her and the pain that she's suffering. And when we go to that level, when we sink so low that we only worry about ourselves, that's when we can't possibly love like God does. So on this day that I know I had at least one out of the six really worried about the fact that I was going to bring them up here and let you all ask them questions or actually make them preach. I hope that the six of them seek what Solomon saw. And not just the six of them, but everyone in this room seeks what Solomon saw. Because there's enough hurt and there's enough pain to go around. And the only way that the world is going to change is if we, as those who love and follow after God, do something about it. And that is to seek God's wisdom. And that is to follow where He leads us. And that is to love everybody as they are, not trying to change them because we can't change anybody, only God can. And if we can love them where they're at, God's love is going to come in and take over all of their lives, and then He's going to take over from there. So I pray that we all stand strong in our faith, even when we don't get it, even when we can't understand it, even when we sometimes fight with it. But knowing that God is always walking with us, and through that we can love the world and show them exactly how much God loves them. Because I know that the six of you, even though you struggle with your faith, 
are going to do great things in this world. I know that. Because I've watched you over three years. When you used to sit in these pews as seventh graders. You've come a long way. And I only pray that all of us will do exactly the same. Seek God's wisdom and follow where he leads you.